Okay, let's review periodic trends. Remember, Mendeleev was supposedly a card player. I think he was. And you see when you organize cards in numerical order, it's going up by one. And when you organize all the aces, all the twos, all the threes, all of these are alike and that they're the same number. The periodic chart is organized in a similar fashion. The thing that's going up by one is the number of protons and a corresponding number of electrons because they're all neutral. And when you organize them by chemistry, for example, all group one metals, when you throw them in water, they, re they react vigorously. And as you move down this group, they react even more vigorously. So that was a piece of data. They were trying to figure out what's going on here, what's actually in the atom. And these form compounds with the halogens, one of these and two halogens. It's always in that molar ratio. So MgCl2 or MgF2, where these form uh, elements or com compounds with one halogen, so NaCl or NaF. So that kind of similar chemistry was organized vertically. Also over here, these were inert. They weren't reactive at all. Now we call them the noble gases. These all had a negative one charge in their charged state. So organizing things vertically by chemistry and horizontally by increasing number of protons. This is the best kind of periodic chart, chocolate periodic chart. Remember, Z is just the, print, um, the number of protons. We almost never write actual but just to reinforce that this is different than the Z effective. So Z actual is just the number of protons. Here we are moving across period three, N equals three sodium to argon. Notice what happens, the nuclear charge gets bigger by one. And they all have, whoops, sorry, they all have three, all the valence electrons are in period three. They're getting bigger by one, the number of valence electrons. So when you move across the period, the nuclear charge gets bigger by one. The protons get more numerous by one. So it makes sense that is a bigger nucleus, more nuclear charge, more positive charge. When you go down a group, yes, the nuclear charge gets bigger, but now it's by a whole period, it's not by one. And it's the number of inner core electrons is changing. They all have one single S electron, though. Okay, and that's, that's their reactivity, and that's their valence. So as you go down a group, the nuclear charge changes with Z. We talked about this idea of shielding. If you have inner electron shells, they almost can discount the nuclear charge one for one. For each electron, you can kind of subtract one nuclear, one, uh, nuclear charge, one proton. And um, this is just a minimization of the, of the attractive force due to electron repulsions. So look at this. Here's a cross a period from sodium to argon these are the core electrons. These are the only ones that shield. So these are staying constant as we're moving across the period. Two, four, ten electrons are constant as we move across this period. But the nuclear charge is getting bigger, and the number of electrons in the valence are getting bigger. But they don't add next to each other. Why would they never be next to each other if they couldn't? <laughs> They're repulsive forces, they just push away. So the electrons in the valence do not shield each other. These are the only shielders. And across a period, it's constant. But the nucleus is getting bigger. So that's the whole idea here, is that the shielders are constant, but the nucleus is getting bigger. And that means that each successive electron is feeling a growing nuclear charge because the proton count is getting bigger. That means it gets drawn closer to the nucleus and the radius gets smaller. Here's the core, whoops, yeah, here's the core for down the group, group one. The core is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. These are all your shielders. So by the time you get to 6s1, where are we at 6s1? Cesium. That stuff is so reactive, you, you can't handle it. We can't, we can't even buy rubidium. We're not allowed to buy rubidium. We only have those three and they're stored under oil because they're so reactive. Now the question is, how come they get more reactive as you go down the group? Why is it that these are so reactive we can't have them? Mm -hmm. Lauren? Because there are more shielders, so it's um, not going to have as much of a charge um, force in the nucleus. Yeah, and that's, that's an excellent answer. So that's an explanation versus a statement. So she answered it thoroughly. There's more shielding. And so, don't forget, and so, there's less attractive <laughs> force, so it's more reactive. You can think of it as the rows of desks in the room. My desk is the nucleus, kind of radiating positive charge. By the time we get to the last row, all of you inner electrons are shielding the nuclear attractive force 
And consequently, the last row is way, way out. There's no attractive, very little attractive force to the nucleus. Therefore, they come, those electrons come off easy. So nuclear uh, charge is just Z, and the effective nuclear charge, all we have to do is subtract those shielding electrons, and that'll give us this new, slightly diminished, or somewhat diminished, nuclear charge. You just take the actual Z, which is the, the atomic number, and subtract all the shielding electrons, non-valent electrons, core electrons. And that gives you an idea of how big the effect, the, the actual attractive force to the nucleus is. If it gets bigger, the electrons get drawn in tighter. As you move across the period, Z effective increases and shielding is constant. When you go down the group, Z effective decreases because you just have more shells in the way. I showed you this great picture, much better than mine. We have a big nucleus here. We just picked one electron in the valence. We could have picked one over here, over here, over here, or out here, whatever, wherever it is. Just one electron is feeling this nuclear charge, Z, minus all of these shielders in here. And if you had another uh, electron, it would be over here. They wouldn't be next to each other. They wouldn't be in here. They would be, they're in the valence. So they're all on the outside. And they don't shield each other. So you can't subtract those valence electrons. So Z effective is only, is only the actual Z, the proton count, minus the shielders. And the shielders are only these inside. So remember we've got, let's do sodium over here. What's the atomic number of sodium? So we have positive 11. And n equals 2 is going to be pretty close. I'm sorry, n equals 1 is going to be pretty close. They're right next to the nucleus. This one electron is feeling all 11 positive charges. So it gets pulled way in. In fact, until they are no longer, those two electrons repel each other. n equals 2, they, don't, they are not next to each other. They spread out. And I know that this is only a, this is a bad model. It's flat. It's not 3D. <coughs> but it's the best model I can do right here. So uh, this... This shell, if you just look at one electron, it's not feeling positive 11. What is it actually feeling or ha being under the uh, attractive force of? Yeah, we can subtract these two n equals 1 electrons. So this one feels positive 9, which is a bigger, uh, well, lesser force than this guy, so it's a little further away. But now I'm going to exaggerate. Here's n equals 3. This is supposed to be sodium. And this is that single 3s1 electron. So now, what is, who, which ones are shielding? n equals 1, n equals 2. These are all shielding. So how many electrons in the core? So the z effective, z11 minus 10 equals 1. That's not a very strong force for an electron. And consequently, this is a very weak attractive force. If it's a weak attractive force, that means it's a far away electron. It's going to be pulling away. Because remember, these electrons and these are repelling each other. So if this one's not held tightly and being repelled by this, it's going to push away. And now here's the reactivity part. And therefore, it's more reactive. So when we threw sodium metal in the water, what happened? What kind of a reaction is this? A single thing and a double thing. Single replacement, those guys switch out, and what do you get? <coughs> Sorry, I missed it. Sodium yeah, and sodium hydroxide in water, sodium ion and hydroxide ion, it, it breaks apart 100%. Strong base, we'll cover that in a coming chapter. And what was the other product? Yeah, we don't ever have just H. At room temperature, it's always H2. And what do we know about H2 gas? Think Hindenburg. It's flammable. This is also an exothermic reaction. So delta H is negative. Exothermic, that heat next to that, it blows up. And you saw that. When I threw it in the water, it blew. It burned. So we went from sodium metal to sodium ion. Now balance that redox equation. What else was there? It went from a zero oxidation to a positive one. So what had to happen? 
loss in electrons. So is this oxidation or reduction? That's the ox step. So that electron is that electron. That was why we had to balance those equations. That electron that gets gets removed or reacts is that electron. It's very reactive. So all group one metals react with water in the same way. They're very reactive. Now we have to go across the period. What's on the, at the end of that period? Uh -huh. Argon. Argon. <laughs> so I got to make this. How many um, protons in the nucleus? So I got to make this one bigger. That one had what? 11. This one has 18. Is that bigger? Yeah. More or less? <laughs> That's pretty big. Where is that first shell going to be? Very really, close. really close. In fact, I'm just going to like make it right out here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> N equals 2. Pretty close because only two electrons are shielding these positive 18s. So the next one's also pretty close. And how many valence electrons in N equals and N equals three? But each one, Z effective, is 18 minus these two. Oops, I forgot to draw these. That's a pretty strong force. So where is this last shell going to be? Bigger or smaller than that one? Yeah, it's going to be much smaller, so I'm going to make it about like that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So here's n equals three. Hang on just a sec. We just pick any one of those valence electrons in the shell, in the valence shell. It's feeling an attractive force of plus eight. It's a positive, I'm sorry, it's a negative one, and it's feeling plus eight. So they all get drawn in pretty tightly. So the valence the valence electrons are drawn in pretty tightly. Just let me wrap this up. So the atomic radius is small. But what atom is this? How come it's not reactive? How come it's inert? Now, back in December, we could say because it reached noble gas configuration, or it's uh, a noble gas. But that's a statement, not an explanation. So now we got to explain why it does not react. So because it has a really strong um, like, attraction to the nucleus. And so therefore, it's unlikely to react because it feels like the, um, that donates the protons per its length to the electron. Yep, wait, let me, i got to catch up. Oh. So uh, a strong attraction. So they're all drawn in. So st strong attraction to the nucleus. Another way of saying strong attraction, you can use the phrase tightly held. That's fine. They are tightly held. Okay, they're tightly held and therefore, therefore, non-reactive. And you could, whoops, ran out of room. We could go partway across and say the same thing, less reactive. That electron is less likely to come off, those valence electrons, because they're very loosely held over here. They're very likely to come off here. As you move to the right, they are more strongly held. By the time you get to noble gas, they are so tightly held that they're not reactive. You really have to force them to react. Okay, sorry. Somebody had a question, and now Paul has his hand up, so I'll ask you first. Yeah, Something. Just, could you still like, have a full test what we're looking for? In December, that was our sufficient answer. Now we have to explain what, so what does having a full octet mean? So in AP world, that's a statement versus explanation. You just make a statement, and so on your test, I just write SVE, and you don't get the point. So the full explanation is what Anushka was saying. The valence is drawn in because the nucleus is so big, Z effective is so high. And remember, valence electrons don't shield each other, so we can't subtract them from in here. These are only core. Because they're so tightly drawn in, they experience a really strong attractive force. Or another way of saying that is they're tightly held to the nucleus, and therefore they're non-reactive. So now you have to say the whole answer. And by the way, everybody is in the same boat as you, because in December, we left saying because it reached noble gas configuration. Lauren, don't worry, we'll get to you guys. Is the effective just related to the number of um, valence electrons? 
Yes, it's, it's the electron of interest in the valence. You could pick any one of them. And it's what it experiences or what effect it's under. Okay. Uh, Genevieve? Well, it's the full explanation. You can't just end at it's reached noble gas configuration. So ask yourself, so what? What does that mean, noble gas config? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Or another way of saying is the electron does not come off easily. That's reactivity. Not that you have to restate the statement like an English test. No, it's that you're actually answering fully the question. Why doesn't this electron come off? In other words, why is it non-reactive? It's tightly held. It's tightly held. Why is it tightly held? Because the nucleus is so big and we're only subtracting out those two inner layers. You don't subtract out all those valence electrons. And I think Radha had a question no, or Pat that. and Connor. Say again, if you added an electron, yeah. so would a sodium negative one. Yeah, like would it change the shape? Well, that wouldn't happen unless you did something to it. That's not going to happen in our world. It's going to be either sodium metal, Na, or sodium cation plus one. You wouldn't have negative, like yeah. sodium ide. You wouldn't have that. But yes, why would it change something? If you're adding another electron, what are they going to do? They're going to repel. So I have a slide that. I'm going to come back to that question. Somebody else had a question though over here? No? Yes, Anushka? Um, okay, we'll, it'll come back, I'm sure. So remember, we're, we're cutting down that Z, the full nuclear charge, by only the shielders, the core, the non-valence electrons. And it's a sec essentially one for one. That's a really good approximation. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question. Uh -huh. That's right. Okay, so let's change this from sodium. And now let's fill this valence shell. <coughs> Excuse me. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight is over there. So now we have a full valence. That's n equals three. N equals four is now being shielded by three layers of electrons. So it's way over here. There's n equals four. Here's potassium's 4s1 electron. So it's so far away from the nucleus that it's, there's really no effect, there's no attractive force to the nucleus at all. And it comes off really easily. So this is like we get to Dalton, n equals one, n equals two, n equals three, n equals four. All of these inner electrons are blocking my desk's nuclear charge. And if each one of these layers is negatively charged, they're going to spread out. So this electron is negative. It's going to spread out from this negativeness. So, and it's also not under the influence of a big nucleus, a big nuclear charge, because we're subtracting 2 and 8 and 8. So the Z effective is so weak, sorry, the Z effective is so weak that it's not tightly held. And then here's that last bit, and therefore it's highly reactive. Anushka, you remember? Yeah. So even though, like, the increase, like, the excited photons, is increasing as you go down the group, because you're adding more and more energy levels, that doesn't, like, counteract the new, like, they, they do subtract out. Yeah, yeah, they are shielding. Yeah. Exactly. That reactivity gets bigger. So this is a pretty good approximation. So we already did this, but let's review it again. N equals 2 N, O, and F. Uh, atomic number 7, 8, and 9. So 7, 8, and 9 protons. The core stays the same. Hydrogen and helium. N equals, N equals 1 electrons. So this is constant. So the nucleus, uh, the effective nuclear charge gets bigger. That means they, those electrons pull in. So as you move from nitrogen to fluorine, it gets smaller. But someone asked about, I think, Connor, you alluded to this. So fluoride ion, here's fluoride. I'm sorry, here's fluorine. Fluoride is noble gas configuration, neons configuration. 
but it's atomic number nine. It still only has two electrons, so its Z effective is nine. Neon is number 10, minus those two electrons, so its effective nuclear charge is eight. But look at sodium ion. Here's sodium metal. Sodium ion is neon's noble gas configuration, 11 protons. There's still only two core electrons because now this is the valence. N equals two is the valence. You gotta make sure everybody heard that. Everybody look up here a sec. Sodium is N equals three, but sodium ions valence is now N equals two. And that means we still only have two core electrons. So look how big the Z effective is. So which one's going to be smaller? So with ions like the valence electrons, like the whichever shell level can change. Depending yeah. On the, the valence is always the outermost yeah. electron. So if the sodium metal loses an electron, so N equals 2 is now the valence. Yeah. So these are, these are constant. So Z effective goes up. So this is the smallest yeah. atomic radius. Yes, ma'am. I mean ionic radius. Mm-hmm. And for the same level of reactivity as like hydrogen, lithium, and sodium, because they were like, because it, okay, sorry, it's taking me a while. No, that's fine. So, the, because those elements are like trying to gain one valence right. electron, while the other ones are trying to lose right. one, so wouldn't they be the same, or is it? Right. Like in a in a simple sort of explanation, yeah, that's a that's a pretty good approximation, but now you're in XL chem, which is like AP chem, so it's not it's not exact. Um, I think the idea of what they were trying to tell you is that in the halogens, you're going to add one electron. That's easier than losing seven electrons and going back to the previous noble gas configuration versus the cation or the group one metals become cations because rather than filling seven more spots, it's easier to lose that one spot. So in general chem, elementary, or what do you call it, middle school, it's fine to say it's easier to lose one electron than to gain seven and they want to reach noble gas configuration or fill the octet. Those are fine for middle school, but not for our level anymore. You have to explain why is it that potassium is so much more reactive than sodium. All of these are all core. We have another layer of eight electrons subtracting out the, the attractive force of the nucleus. But as a general rule, are mm. the group ones just as like, um, reactive as the group no. ones? Like, not Well, first of all, we're calling reactivity this loss of an electron, this oxidation. Fluorine doesn't lose an electron. In fact, fluorine does not exist like this at room temperature. How does it exist? Yeah, it's F by itself is too reactive. This is how it, it exists. But does that, is that the same? Well, you know, it's, it's not an equivalence. It's a good idea, though, for when you're in middle school, for sure. Yes, so now? Oh, so sodium ion, sodium metal is 1, 2, 3, 3, S1. If it loses that single S1 electron, that was that one, it drops back to the previous noble gas. You can write it 1S2, 2S2, 2P6, or you can write helium, 2S2, 2P6. Um, neon, I think that's okay. I even think it's okay on the AP. I just have to check. Uh, yes, Pat. Um, it says like the eight halogens for the different things. Uh-huh. They all have ten electrons, but why is it? Because they all have ten electrons. No, wait. Oh, because they've all gained. Gained. That was at ten, and it's lost. Yes. So why is it so like eleven minus two? Because this is the atomic number. This is the number of protons. Oh. And that what's the same here though, Pat, is the core. The, and that's the, those are the shielders. This is getting bigger by one, but this is staying the same, so the Z effective gets bigger. So the bigger the Z effective, the more they get pulled in. So sodium ion is going to be the smallest, even though they all have the same configuration, which is neon. Yes, Genevieve? Mm -hmm. Sulfur atom? Okay, so it's not charged, it's not the ion, just the atom? Take off an electron? Okay. Will the 
So we would not do that in this class. If we were peak chemists, physical chemists, I mean, then yeah, we would probably do it. But let's not try to quantify that reactivity because what we're looking at here is the trend. What is, what is the trend as you move across a period or down a group? What I need to make sure you understand is that you move to the right, the atom gets smaller because the effective gets bigger. Why does the effective get bigger? Her explanation over there, strong attractive force, the, the core stays the same. As you go down the groups, the shells get bigger further away. They're all, every electron in the valence is shielded by these inner cores. So they are very far away, very reactive. That's what we need to focus on, making sure we get. Because this last little bit of the story is the ionization energy. I know some of you have done it on the web assign. So remember, we can't measure a cloud. So what we do instead is we get homonuclear diatomics and measure from the dense nucleus to the dense nucleus. Half of that distance is R. So it's called atomic radius, even though we're talking about the diameter of the shell. We can't measure the diameter. We can only measure the radius when they're like this. So here's all that data collected together. And Connor, you had a question before that I was going to come back to on this. It's the next slide. Well, look what happens as you move across the period. It does get smaller. Yes, I know something weird happens there. It does get smaller. Okay, so Z effective is getting bigger as you're moving across from sodium to argon. Okay, and by the way, purple are the metals and yellow are the non-metals. Well, aluminum is a metal. So as you move across the period, the atomic radius gets smaller. And as you move down the group, it gets bigger. It gets smaller across the period because increasing nuclear charge, but the core, the shielders stay the same because all the valence, they don't, they don't shield each other. Down the group, you've got lots of shielding. Each one of these layers shields those core electrons. Okay, this was Connor's question. What about the charged ions? So if you're a physical chemist or an early chemist and you're looking at this data, you go, okay, we got this down. Move across the period, it gets smaller. Uh-oh. What happened here? <laughs> Sophia? Yeah, yeah. So let's look at sulfur. Sulfur atom, number 16, sulfide ion. How many electrons in sulfide ion? 18. So let's go back a slide. Sulfur atom, 16. It's way over here at 3P4. So it's pretty far to the right in the period, so it's getting pretty small. You can see that here. But the ion, we've added a couple of electrons. So here's an analogy. You and nine of your best friends are on, in a circle in chairs. And you all want to sing Kumbaya and hold hands. So you all scoot in until what happens? You can't scoot in anymore, right? You're all shoulder to shoulder, knee to knee. You know, your chairs are all smushed together. So you're in a circle of 10. We're all attracted to each other. So we pull in. The electrons pull in because they're attracted to the nucleus. But then when they get too close to each other, they repel, or you're shoulder to shoulder. You just can't squeeze anybody into the circle. So now your 11th best friend comes in. <laughs> what happens? Everybody has to scoot their chair back a little bit to make room for that 11th electron. And it gets bigger. So again, everybody wants to sing Kumbaya. You all start pulling in until now the 11 chairs are and shoulders. Everyone's too close together. So that's the repulsive force of the electrons. So what happens is compared to our sodium, what, um, uh, yeah, sulfur. 104, what is the units? Pico, picometers? It's got to be picometers. 104 to 184. So adding those two electrons, that's when you're two best friends. So you have to make the circle even bigger. So you're repelling, but you're attracted. Where that balance is met, that's the atomic radius. So when the attractive force towards the nucleus, of the electrons toward the nucleus, matches the repulsive force of them getting too close together. So the ions, sorry, the anions are always bigger than the atoms. And the cations smaller. are always smaller. Because this is when you're a group of 10 and someone says, I got to go. And everyone says, OK, let's scoot in a little more to sing Kumbaya. Because now we still have the same attractive force. And there's fewer of electrons they can scoot in. So sodium's 90, sodium ions 95. Sodium metal is 186. So here's all 11 electrons. Here we've lost one. Well, we still have the same nuclear charge. The 10 electrons get drawn in even tighter. 
So that's in English what I just said. <laughs> and here's the other picture. Sodium, losing an electron. Ooh, oxidation. Leo. Potassium, losing an electron. Leo. Getting a lot smaller because we have the same nuclear charge but fewer number of electrons, so they just get drawn in a little tighter. Here's the anion. Oh, here's their configuration. You already know all that. Oh, let's review since you wanted to review. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. Do you have to write all that? No. We could write, what's 2p6? Neon. Neon, square brackets, 3s1. Neon, or the whole thing. Here we have 1s2, 2s, blah, 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 blah. So what's 3p6? So we could write argon in square brackets, 4s1, and argon. Now we go to the other side. Fluorine atom, 64 nanometers. Gain an electron, and look at our, our configuration, 2p5 to 2p6. So now we're at what, what noble gas? And chlorine to chloride. Now we're at argon. All good? The last little tidbit is ionization, ionization energy, and I need a volunteer. Naya. Oh, you were my volunteer before. That's okay. Come here. Okay. You've all heard the expression, taking candy from a baby. Candy, baby. <laughs> well, pretend. Okay, first of all, I'll get you out of the light. Okay, make a jazzy hand. Jazzy hand. Jazzy hand. Well, but we're only going to do one. Oh, okay. To make it simpler, we'll do one. Jazzy hand. Electron. Electron. Now you have to hold this. Jazzy hand. Electron. <laughs> this is the nucleus. Attractive force, because this is negative, this is positive. We're going to be sodium first, way over here. Sodium's one electron is way far away. Okay, the attractive force to the nucleus is pretty small, so guess what? So easy to take the candy from the baby. Not very strong, like barely grip it. It's just ready to fall off. Put it in water, it falls off. Now we go halfway across the period, sodium to, how about, aluminum. Now, the nucleus has gotten bigger. You have to hunch your shoulders and make yourself bigger, make your arm go out. Yeah, now the nucleus is bigger. <laughs> so this jazzy hand electron is getting drawn in. So it's going to be a little harder for me to take the candy from the baby. And now you have to get really, really big. Keep going. All the best jokes are gone. Now this electron, it's so tightly held that I, I have to come over here so we can record it. There you go. I have to put in so much energy to get this candy from the baby. Finally, I get it. Okay? So way over here. So easy it falls off, way over here, so tightly held that you just really have to put a lot of energy to getting this candy, this electron, out of the baby. Thank you so much. Okay. That was really awesome. Yeah, my best electron ever was. This is the, yeah, the best atom uh, in a period. She was all of them. So there's an actual definition. The first thing you have to do is boil the atom. That way they're all gases. We all start from the same point, gaseous atoms. That's a lot of energy right there, right? Think of boiled sodium. Then you zap it with energy. Finally, an electron comes off. That's all easy to measure if you were a physicist. That is what the ionization energy is called. It's to remove an electron. And I know it sounds like making an ion is also adding an electron, but that has another name called the electron affinity. So ionization is how much energy it takes to remove an electron from the gaseous atom. The higher... The IE, the harder it is to remove. So by the time we're argon, it's a really high amount of energy for me to pull the, the electron from her hand. So now, and by the way, that was the first, as I moved across the period from sodium to argon, that was just the, uh, the one outer electron. I didn't take off more than one outer electron. But now I'm going to take off successive electrons from one element, aluminum. So aluminum, you boil it, boiled aluminum, and then you zap it with energy. How much energy? Until finally an electron comes off this much, 580 kilojoules per mole. That's a lot of energy. Now, you're a physicist. And you think, okay, if I zap it with another 580, what should happen? Another electron. So you zap it with 580, and nothing happens. So you crank up the energy. And finally, when you get to 1,800, three times as much, almost. Then the second electron comes up. How come? What do you do with that data? Something wrong with my machine? No, you do it again and again. How come it's nearly three times as much? 
Well, well what's changed? Because they're tighter. They're tighter because, yes? Stronger. There's one less electron. How many um, uh, protons are in aluminum? So there's 13 here. There's still 13 here. But there's only 12 electrons. So Joyce, you said it right. They're more tightly held. So now when we zap those those ions, those plus one ions, those electrons are even harder to remove. Yeah, it's reflected in the higher IE. So the second ionization is higher. So you go, okay, well, I zap it with another 1,800. It should come off the next electron. But no, it's actually 2,700. Well, that makes sense. We still have 13 protons, but we only have 11 electrons. So they are pulled way in. That makes sense. Okay, yay, so we, we've explained those three electrons, it makes sense. So you zap it with another 2,700 and no, it's not until you get to 11,600 kilojoules, a full order of magnitude higher. So you're a chemist, what, what explanation? How come it's so much harder to remove that next, that fourth electron? Yeah, Saskia? Why? But there, why wasn't it just a linear trend? Why did we make this huge jump in IE? These are valence. What, what valence are we at here? N equals what? N equals three, what's this one? So these are like this very tightly held shell right next to the nucleus. So the fourth ionization is remo removing a core electron. All right, so you're an early chemist. You pull all this data together. A little bit of energy, 500 kilojoules. Hmm, which was less than that. What's going on there? Another good question for a test. So you're zapping these successive ionizations, the first one, then a huge jump. That's why I put it in red. You do two in a row and then a huge jump. You do three in a row and then a huge jump. And then you keep doing it. So what do you deduce? Yeah, but what about this one and this two and this three and this four? Valence. Valence. So these are valence, these are valence, these are valence. So this is more valence electrons. So group one, group two, group three, group four. What happened here? We never experienced a big jump. So what do we need to do? more and more energy until we finally see that big jump in IE. And then we know now we've reached the core electrons. We've reached one shell down. This confirmed the valence. So this data confirmed the number of valence electrons in each one of these elements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Pat? Yeah. All right, so yes. Mm -hmm. Is there a word for like when you reach um, the amount of energy required to remove one valence electron? Is ionization energy. Yeah, IE, yeah. These are successive ionizations, though, of one element. This is the first ionization. So I need to make sure you get that. These are successive, one through five. And I didn't even go all the way to the valence on these groups, right? This is first ionization energy. So let's go back to our example with Naya. So we started with sodium. The electron was dangling way out here, very loosely held. Therefore, it's easier to remove. So is its IE going to be high or low? So low because, and I, I got to tell you, that's the easiest way to screw up. You got to make sure you think through. Don't just memorize it. Think through. If it's far away from the nucleus, it's really easy to take away. And so its IE is low. Ionization energy is low. Now you go to the other side. It's really tightly held. So it's going to take a lot of energy. So if we roughly plot that, let's get rid of potassium and roughly plot ionization energy across a period. So this is IE, and this is the atomic number getting bigger by one across a period. So atomic number getting bigger. We're going to start low over here at sodium, and it's going to get higher as we move across the period. That is the rough periodic trend. 
it gets harder and harder to remove an electron as you get over to the noble gases. Well, that makes sense. They're tightly held. They're strong attraction. So here I've plotted all of that. Hydrogen to helium, lithium to neon, sodium to argon, potassium to krypton, et cetera, even including the d orbitals, the transition metals. But what's up with down the group? Helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, radon. So what, why is the IE getting lower down the group? What happens down a group? There's more and more sodium electrons, so therefore it's easier for the... Yep. Uh, By the time you get to that last row, that very bottom number, they are so loosely held, they come off easy, which means that their IE is lower than the previous noble gas. Just, yeah. So across a period, IE increases, it gets harder to remove an electron. You got to put more energy into it. Down a group, whoops, I didn't put the rest of them on here. Down a group, we could put the first one. Oops, <laughs> kind of exaggerated. I'm going to put helium way up here. Down a group, it gets lower because there's more shielding, because there's these inner shells. So going across, you have the bigger nuclear charge, same energy valence level. They don't shield each other. Down a group, there's a whole bunch of shielding. So what else do you notice about this? Besides the fact that there's a typo. You probably never find the typo. I'd have to point it out to you. All right, so you're an early chemist, and you're like, okay, the, it seems to be a pretty much positive IE as you move across the period. But suddenly there's a little drop here, and here, and here, and here. because oh, it's, what it's, a, it's yes. going uh, from different energy levels. Because, like, uh, you know, for example, from, like, magnesium to aluminum, that happens? And that's, like, uh, going from, like, the, like, S orbital. Exactly, orbital. yeah. So remember I told you before, there's a lot of different ways to represent the orbitals, a little box, arrows. Off-bow diagram is the best. Here's why. Because it's energy. You can also think of it as distance from the nucleus. Nucleus is down here. 1s1 1 1S, 1 and 2. 2s1 2 and 2. And instead, I usually draw the p orbitals out here. I'm going to line them up here just to exaggerate the fact that, where are we now? 2p1 is what? Say again? Boron. What's 2p2s2? 2 2 2? Beryllium. So these are normally core. That means they're the shielders. But these are, I've exaggerated it, these are a little bit lower in energy. The s orbital electrons are a little bit lower in energy, a little bit closer. They have a slight shielding effect. And that's what's seen right here. From beryllium to boron, magnesium to sodium. I'm sorry, magne yeah, magnesium to, uh-oh, there's our typo. That aluminum is supposed to be right there. That was an image in the old book. So going from magnesium to aluminum, these 3s2 electrons shield the 3p1 just a little bit. That's why there's just a little bit of a joggle there. What about that other little joggle? Well, come back to the off-bow diagram. Where does that first little anomaly occur? Where it dips down? Nitrogen, nitrogen to oxygen. What's nitrogen's electron configuration? Two P three. And what's oxygens? Where does it go now? What happens here? Whoops. What are these arrows representing? Electrons. And what's their charge? They're both negative. You get them close together. It's like throwing two cats in a bag, right? They start fighting. 
So you have a little bit more reactive. It's a little bit more reactive, a little less stable. That means it's a little easier to take off the electron, and so there's a little dip in the IE trend. And that same dip is seen between potassium, or I mean um, phosphorus and sulfur. I don't think, yeah, is arsenic on there? Somewhere, it's kind of lost in the, the shuffle. You can't really see it, it's too diffuse. Um, that same sort of thing, though, happens between zinc and gallium. Here's zinc, there's gallium. All of these transition metals and all of the core, there's shielding. So there's a little bit of an anomaly. Here's that same data, but it's plotted in a 3D plot. I gotta tell you, this doesn't do much for me. This is really the best explanation. This is a really good, except for that one typo, this is a really good uh, graphic showing ionization energy trends. Who has a question? Just like taking candy from a baby. I don't believe we're covering this, so I'm going to skip it. And that's the next topic. Yes, sir. Can you look at the boron and chlorine Sure. I understood, like, when you yeah, and unfortunately, you missed all of that last semester. But the the orbital. Because um, it's a race oxygen. So the filling order. The off-bow filling order from low energy to high. So as you move across, let's start with hydrogen. Let's just start over because <laughs> you are absent for this. I mean, you weren't here for this. So the very first <clears throat> energy level is called 1s. The orbital, you can think of it as a box. It can only hold two electrons. And it's because of those quantum numbers, negative uh, and positive one-half spin. We don't have to worry about that. We're just going to say up, down, two electrons. That's it. So when this is filled, we say 1s2, superscript 2. It's full. It can't hold any more electrons. So if you add more electrons, and by the way, where are we here? Hydrogen, helium. That's why this, uh, this is full. We've moved across a period, tightly held. Helium is very unreactive. We go to the next shell, n equals 2. That's, and it's OK to think of these as the Bohr model. That's a good model. So this is 2s2. Uh, there's two electrons. The two electrons are hydrogen, helium, beryllium. And then the, th the two p electrons, I mean, sorry, the three orbitals of the 2p level are slightly higher in energy than 2s. So these were the spherical ones. These were the ones that are shaped like that in the little video I showed you. The shape, yeah, yeah. You don't have to know how to derive it. It's all that calculus in the PowerPoint. Oh, the shape, yeah, yeah. Just these two, though, you guys. Yeah, just those two, sphere and lobe. That's fine. So, Paul, when these fill, we were, where are we now? 2s2 is what? So when we add another electron, it the next lowest orbital is 2p. It can hold, each one can hold two. Uh, it's just the next higher one. This word, off bow, means building up from low energy to high. Just like when you pour water in a graduated cylinder, it starts at the bottom up. But this is called Hun's rule. They don't fill up completely if there's another orbital in that, that period type or that orbital type where an electron could go. So in other words, if this is the first one, there's one in there, and it doesn't matter that there's two lobes. There's just one electron in there. The next one to fill might be that one. In other words, you wouldn't join up to if you could be over here. And then the third one, which is in and out of the board, fills up. Only until all of them have one in them do they then double fill. And in the case of oxygen, when it double fills, there's a little bit of instability because there's two electrons close to each other. And that's what's reflected in this IE, where there's a little dip right there, again, between phosphorus and easier to, easier to take off because it's a little more, a little more unstable because there's two electrons. But as you move all the way across the period, now Z effective is pretty big here. So at this point, noble gas configuration, 2P6, that's a pretty big Z effective. 
And it's also noble gas config, but that's not a, an answer anymore. Last semester it was, but now we know the reason this is so stable, what gas is this? Neon, the reason that's so stable is because it has a big Z effective, and therefore all the electrons are pulled in tightly, and therefore they're not, they're not very reactive. Ah, sorry, so let's go back to this. All of these electrons aren't there yet when you go from beryllium. Now the next one is boron. These are the shielding electrons here, the core, n equals 1. These are all valence. Yes, there are three electrons in the valence, but two of them are a little bit lower in energy, and they shield a little bit. You can think of this as distance. So in the Bohr model, here's n equals 1. Right. That's why it's so, so here's here's boron. Where's the s orbitals? And there's no there's no it's just a line, right? A circle. There's no differentiation between s and p orbitals. Here with the Aufbau diagram, you can see s is different than p. S orbitals are different than p orbitals in both the shape and the amount of energy and other stuff way beyond the scope of our class. All good. Okay, let me pause this.